All right, so a couple of demos. Uh, the first thing is Google Dorks. Um, you can find funny pages that um, people did not intend to make public by using these special queries. So this looks in the URL for the string PHP error log and a bunch of websites create a PHP error log and make it publicly available. So as I went through these, I found um, this one here, for example, this is just an automatically generated series of all the errors of this page. And the PHP errors don't tend to include anything very important, path names and stuff, nothing obvious here like passwords or cookies, but it's frequently left unprotected. And there are others, one of the real prizes is Elma error logs. I haven't found a recent one of those. Elma errors were in Microsoft Windows logger. Toyota had it wide open for a while, good clean fun. So every time there was an error resolving a Toyota URL, it would put the entire request in the log that was publicly available. So all you'd have to do is email or send an IM to someone with a Toyota link with an apostrophe in it. If any clicked it and they were logged into Toyota, it would take their cookie and put it up in the error log. And you could then get in their account. Um, that's, that's why these errors often contain sensitive information. They shouldn't be available to the whole world but people often make these mistakes. So here's one, this is Elma. Oh, here's your, good, they do have an Elma here. So this is an open Elma from something called lj24magazine.com. They have an open Elma page. And so here, error with something not found, and if you go to details, it gives you all kinds of details about this request. HTTP accept user agent, and it may even give you cookies this looks like this person was not logged in or something, but you get a whole lot of information about the request of some user that had a problem. And this has their, their, um, their IP address and so on. You know, this is unhealthy to just make this available to the whole world. And uh, so it can be used to leak things out. And it's one of the many things you can do with these Google dorks. Um, this one wasn't much fun. Here's these PHP errors. We saw those. And I had another one here. Yeah, this one here was MySQL errors. If you have SQL injection pages or SQL errors of various kinds, it'll show up. This is one of the less important MySQL errors, but there are a bunch of others. And um, so you can find pages that have SQL errors in them. So this part of the page was tried to demonstrate by fetching from a database, and there was an error in this query, and here's the whole query just printed there. And here's a syntax error, and the syntax error strongly implies that there's a, a SQL injection somewhere. So if I had apostrophes up here or something, I can exploit it. That's why these SQL errors are nothing the user should ever see. It's, and here's another one. This page has been hacked. There's a login form, and there's more down here. And you can see they were able to modify this page and fill it with spam. And this is uh, called reputation theft. What people do is they fill your page with junk, and that contains keywords. And now Google will take your page and find the keywords on there. And what they do is they like to hack governments and education sites because Google ranks them as more credible. So they will hack like your blog on the city college server and fill it with spam about Viagra. And now if someone searches for Viagra, they will find that page because it comes from a reputable source and has the word Viagra on it. And then they put a redirector that will go somewhere else. And I found a bunch of colleges that have been hacked this way. And it is technically reputation theft. It's considered a low priority for most companies because it doesn't directly hurt them, but it does cause them to fall in credibility. And eventually they'll start getting blocked by any virus engines and Google and stuff for having malware on their page. But when I tried to contact people and get them to fix it, they mostly just couldn't understand me and accused me of hacking them and freaked out um, and wouldn't fix it. But here's another one of the SQL errors on that page. And here's another one all full of SQL error. My SQL error with query, select star from nucleus, and so on. Um, these are pages with various SQL errors on them. And uh, they may or may not be exploitable where you can inject SQL, but they indicate failure of SQL. And if you use other Google Dorks, you can find pages with SQL errors. And uh, I've often, I found exposed passwords this way and such, because what happens is people will post on forums the exact query that does a SQL injection and exposes something. And you can find that in the Google search even if you're too shy to directly try the ejection yourself. And here's another one, MySQL error with this query. So I know they're leaking out a bunch of, of table names and field names and source code that they really shouldn't be leaking out. There's a lot of these pages out there that leak out internal configuration data that is really none of your business. Anyway, then I want to demonstrate this new project, which is the beginning of one that's going to grow. I found a blog 
that talks about how to hack into Hackathon, and it's very nice, and I'm going to follow it. And I wrote the first part of it, so I put it here as W230. It's only 10 points now, but there's going to be a bunch more parts of it added that are extra credit. And if you go to this blog, this uh, was just a few months ago. This person went through and found a whole bunch of cool things you can do with Hackathon. So I just put the first one here as far as I got today, but by next week, I should have three or four more sections of this. And I wanted to show you the most common attack, which is cross-site scripting. So you have to use BERT proxy, and I could have used the insecure version, but I got fed up with that and I actually decided to use the secure version. So if you want to put a secure version in, um, use secure websites, then you have to do this, and it's all explained in the uh, instructions. But first you go to preferences, and then throw the proxy in Firefox, and you set it to use 127.0.0.1 on port 8080, which is the default anyway. Now it's gonna feed through burp. Now in your burp, of course, you have to turn off intercept, and then you have to go to proxy options and make sure it's listing on 127.0.0.1.8080, which is the default, but secure pages won't load. It'll just give you error messages. So you have to import the certificate into burp. And the way you do it is first you set it up going through here, and now you can do insecure pages like ad.sams.info. So this is insecure, so it'll load even without knowing the, um, it'll load successfully, even without trusting BERT. And the reason these load is because I've already done this before, but what you do in this browser is you go to HTTP slash slash BERT, once you're going through BERT. And now you can download the certificate. I gotta spell it right though, there. Now you can download the certificate here and save it. And then you can just go into the settings certificates and import it into Firefox. And then Firefox will know to trust Burp. And I've done that. So I can actually load a secure website, HTTPS Hackathon. I used to use the insecure one to make it easier, but now insecure ones raise warnings in your browser and nobody's using insecure sites. So I figured I better upgrade my projects to use secure websites. So here's Hackathon. The load Hackathon looks like this is my Hackathon server. And so let's take a look at how Hackathon works. I'm going to clear history. And I'm going to, um, all right. And I would like to clear cookies, but I think I won't. All right. So now if I just refresh this page at Hackathon, we can look here. Here's a get. So when you get this page, you send a request to the server. And my browser has a bunch of cookies left over from before. It has a Cloudflare cookie because I protected the site with Cloudflare. It has a PHP session ID. And then it has a list of products I've visited in the past. Um, if it's the first time you've gone here, it will have nothing but the PHP session ID. But when you first request, let's see if I can figure out how to delete just those cookies. I think I can. Um, I'd like to show you from the clean site. So let's go cookies. Okay. Strict custom, uh, here cookies. There. Clear data. And... Some browsers will let me delete just the cookies from one website, but this one doesn't seem to do it, which is pretty annoying. Well, I'll just clear them all. I cleared them all. It means I'll have to have trouble logging into Kahoot again, but you have to make certain sacrifices for the cause. All right. So now let's clear all this old junk. All right. And now if I just go to the Hackers on website and load it, I get just this part and see here, when I did my get, it did not send any cookies up because I just deleted them. So this is what would happen the first time you visit a site or with a clean browser. And the very first time you connect, it will now set the cookies. So the response has got um, set cookie right here. So it puts this cookie in my browser. This is going to expire, I guess, a C Cloudflare cookie comes in and a PHP session cookie comes in. And that one expires in 1981, which is kind of nuts. I guess that must be in forever. <laughs> uh, they must, I guess a negative number must be in forever. I don't quite get that. But anyway, um, it installs this PHP session ID. So when I connect, I now am labeled with session ID. So now when I load other parts of the page, or if I indeed just refresh the page, the second time I load the same page, my browser is now gonna send up all those cookies. So I go to the request, it sent them up, the Cloudflare and the session ID. So now it knows who I am. Just like Google and Amazon, even though I haven't logged in, it's marked me with this random number and I, it knows who I am and what I'm doing. 
So now, um, here's the most simple vulnerability you see all the time. So if I put something here like Fred, and I search for Fred, the page that comes back has Fred on it. Now, it didn't find anything, but it appears to have echoed back what I put in. Now, this is very dangerous. This suggests I might be able to put something bad here. Like if I put italic, dirt, and search, this becomes italic. So apparently, it let me put in tags, and it echoed the tags back, and they rendered as tags. So now, I can start doing nastier things, and that's what we're going to do. Um, we'll start, the simplest thing you always do, just as a proof of concept, is this one. This is the standard proof of concept, script alert one slash script. This, you put that in, and this is JavaScript, script alert one Java. So if you run search there, it now pops up a box. So that means I was able to inject script and run it. Now this doesn't do any harm, this just proves that it let me inject script. And by the way, this is called reflected XSS. It's considered a very low severity vulnerability, perhaps unwisely, because the most obvious thing it does is I can hack myself. I put the code there, the code ran on my machine. What's the problem? Well, we're gonna see. So this is just to prove a concept, but what's more fun would be to steal the cookie. So if I put in alert document.cookie instead of alert one, and I search for that, then the pop-up box includes my cookie, which is my session ID. And if I were logged in, that session ID would be enough to, see, to log in as me, unless they have anti-cross-site request forgery tokens, which they don't, and many sites don't. So, however, again, all I did was reveal it to me, but I can post it to a third party, and there are many ways to do it, and um, here's how I did it. Script fetch, there's a fetch, JavaScript command, which will fetch from a URL, and I wrote a PHP that will just take anything that comes in data and just put it in a text file on my server. You can easily write one of these. So this script will take the cookie and put it on a public server so you can steal it later. And another thing you can do is just send it to your server and look at your server logs. Right now, I've been it on a public server like those ones I showed you, like the Elmos. So this is pretty unsanitary and, and dirty, but it will steal the cookie and put it somewhere. So then I put that in, and I do this, it will now steal the cookie and put it on my server. And I can find out by going to that page, which is here. And when I refresh it, um, yes, there we are. There's a 718. So this is the 718 there. It stole the session ID and put it up on my server. The session ID is 41PT. That's the number we've been seeing all along. If you want to be convinced of that, you can go here and look. That is my session ID. So my secret number that identifies me has been stolen and put on a public server. However, I did it from here. And the, what you would do to complete the attack is you go to Hackazon, and you can see it's all up here in the URL. The search string is up there. So you take that and you email this or send somebody an IM with this in it. There. That is the malicious URL that you have to get somebody to click on. So you run it through tiny URL or something, and you send them a chat message or a spam saying, you want a free iPad, click here to claim it or something, and get them to click on that. And when they do, you get the cookie, if they're logged into this site. And this is, so this is cross-site request forgery, and that's the simplest version of it. And there's a bunch of other phones we'll go through here, but I wanted uh, you to get started doing this. This is the whole story, stealing it on a public server. This is the classic one. This is the most common vulnerability. Something like 80% of all websites have this, reflected cross-site scripting. They take something from the user, and then they put it on the page, and they forget to scrub it. So you can put script in it. This is so common, people won't even pay you anything or pay any attention when you report it. There are whole websites, um, XSS, to humiliate sites with XSS. Um, uh, with XSS. It's so much, you can't even get any attention. Um, so there's like, Sites just to humiliate people, XSS game, using vulnerable sites, 20 famous websites vulnerable. There are, I don't know, I haven't heard it. There used to be a whole bunch of pages and whole Twitter accounts just full of XSS phones. This is one of the most common script kitty things is just find these XSSs and then try to make anybody care or humiliate them. And most people, you can't make them care at all because it is so common. And, um, but, and they think it doesn't matter, but it does matter.
in the hands of a skilled attacker, you can use this to do rotten things. There was a guy, Phone Factor. Phone Factor was one of the first two, two factor authentication providers. And the, what Phone Factor did is you'd log in and then it would call your phone and read you a code and you'd have to type in that code. And he said, this is it, nobody can ever hack me. He said, I'll give you a $10,000 prize if you get in my email, nobody can ever get my email. And so these guys, some professional pen testers said, oh, all right, we're gonna take this guy down. So they loaded his software and ran it and they found out just like you'd think, if you install it on your machine, it has a convenience option where you say, trust this machine and don't keep calling me every time I log in. And if you turn that on, it's not two factor anymore if you're on that trusted machine. And then they wrote a PDF file. They found across this kind of vulnerability on the website, they could steal a cookie. And they put a URL in a PDF file and they emailed it to him and say, we hacked the site, we claimed the $10,000, the proof is in the PDF. So he opened the PDF on his machine. It used this to steal his cookie. It wasn't true until he opened it and then it was true that they got in. Because of course you had to, it wasn't, now he had it dialing him every time somebody logged in. Then when they tried to use the cookie, it would call him on the phone and he'd know they were hacking, but of course he'd turn on the convenience feature. And this is the lesson you know, never do this. Never say, my product is unhackable. And that's why you say, uh, we are aware we probably have problems. We're gonna have a bug bounty program. We're not gonna pretend there'll be no bugs to be found. Instead, we will just have a list. We'll pay you this for this bug, and this for this bug, and we'll just have a steady chain of fixes and updates. That's the way it is. You either admit the truth, which is you've got a thousand flaws, you can't find them all, you'll never patch them all, you're just gonna to have to have steady chain of updates forever, or you're an idiot claiming to have no flaws and the hackers of the world will humiliate the hell out of you <laughs> until you have to admit you're no better than everybody else. Nobody's site is free of bugs. Everybody has an endless chain of bugs. You keep patching them and you keep writing more and that's just the way it is. And that's why they say don't use this stuff for voting. None of this stuff is bulletproof enough for a high value task like that. <laughs> All of it is full of bugs. And if you ever got rid of the bugs, your coders will put in 10 more bugs tomorrow and it will never stop. So anyway, so that's what I wanted to show you. And you might want to do this one and I'll add more to this as we go ahead because there's like four or five more good ones in that blog and I'll put them all in there. Yeah. So since you can design everything with bugs, when yeah. AI comes out, is it going to be a lot harder? Or is it AI will, no, AI will make the defenses stronger and it'll make the attackers stronger. And by the way, the AI itself is very hackable. Remember the very, one of the first AI engines was about five years ago. Microsoft made it a chat botch for like customer service. And they put it on Twitter and all the 4chan type trolls within 24 hours said terrible things to it until it learned to use racist terms and start swearing. <laughs> so, you know, AI introduces new vulnerabilities because it's learning from what you give it. So, the first, any new technology, the first thing it does is introduce new categories of vulnerability. So, you know, it's nothing, nothing will change all that much. The bad guys will start using AI, the good guys will use AI, and it'll, but I think the ratio of good to bad will just stay fixed. But what will happen, of course, is the old generation of attacks will stop working. That's all you ever do. You put in a defense and the old stuff stops working, so the bad guys have to up their game. But there's nothing that will actually stop everything. It just means they have to switch to a new trick. And, and always you've added more stuff. Like now we all fill our house with 100 gadgets that are location aware and for default passwords and listening on goofy ports. So now it's, there's a new wide open door. You know, you lock the door, but then you put in 10 more doors. Then you lock some of them, you put in five more doors. If you were actually to like live in a log cabin and never buy anything new and have everything like 20 years old, then you could be reasonably cyber safe. But if you're gonna be playing the game, having a job, driving a car, having a TV, then you're, not very safe. Yeah, I just learned about the Wi-Fi maps where it shows all the devices that are in Wi-Fi and it's got a manager Mac address. And yeah. Hacking through his way of the phone. Yeah, yeah. And, and you want all the convenience to so accept the risk. Yeah. Well, just the, uh, or just my phone, let's say, hi, Google. Yeah. It kicks in. That means it's listening all the time. It does. So yeah. if I have said anything to anybody, like, you know, change any password or any checking account number or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Address, phone numbers, email. Yeah. And in, in a conversation. Of course. Google has it. It's out there. And by the way, this is nothing new. 40 years ago, the CIA figured out how to bounce a laser off that window and hear every word spoken in here from half a mile away. Okay. It's, the, it's available all along. So your only defense is to be unimportant. 
you're not really planning to kill the president or anything, so why should they bother wasting this fancy tools on you? But if they want to get you, they're getting you, you know? Like, they could shoot you, they could kidnap you, they could bug your house, they could steal your stuff. If somebody wanted to, they could do it if they were motivated and funded. You just hope nobody hates you that much. That's the only reasonable safety. Yeah, they, they deleted the Wuhan doctor that told about the world about the virus. And well, he died. Yeah, he died. And of the virus. It's very suspicious. Yeah, well, I, they could have killed him. But I, dying of the virus is not too suspicious. But yeah. yeah, they didn't time silence him and stuff. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like, what, 1% of the people getting it are dying? And nobody knows that people number people because are, people yeah. say nobody knows that number because you don't really know how many people are infected. Uh, some estimates I've heard say two or three percent, but yeah, you don't. Three percent. Okay, I hear estimates of two or three percent, and then I hear a lot of people yeah, say, "What's that?" But that's the problem. You don't really know how many are infected because a lot of people suspect that the government is hiding it, and also a lot of people are infected and they're not very sick, and you don't know it. And a lot of people haven't really been tested very thoroughly, so you don't really know if that's exactly what they got. So, so the number of how many people infected is hard to get. The swine, the swine like 10%. I don't know. I know. Uh, yeah, the Spanish flu was like ten percent. The Spanish, I thought it's the third. The Spanish flu infected a third of the people on Earth, and it killed a third of the people infected, so it killed like ten percent of the whole population, which was really scary. That's what everyone's afraid of. That was the one that terrified everybody. That was like the Black Death. If they, if they yeah, hopefully, but hopefully in the modern world, you'd be okay, especially in America, because there are, in fact, drugs that help. They're just expensive and rare, and they don't have enough of them. But I think... No, they have to find whether they don't, they don't know who Yeah, in Thailand, they said, you're just giving a bunch of drugs that help. So probably there's only a few cases in America, and they probably have relatively effective treatment. I think Americans have nothing to worry about. But a lot of people in China are dying and very sick, and they're overwhelming the hospitals and everything. So that's where the problem is. And like I say, the real, logical, most effective thing we can do is help China. Running around, closing the borders, scanning people at the airports is all kind of nonsense to protect us here. Really, if you want to save the most people, you should be helping China. <laughs> but, of course, under the Trump administration, we don't think that way at all. We think you know, all, the, all foreigners are bad people and they should all die anyway or something. But, but Unless they have access. Unless you have a lot of money or something. Yeah. But, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get away from this xenophobic nonsense. Anyway, uh, I think I'm going to stop the share. Let's see if this chat message is something I should talk about. What started the Spanish flu? That's a good question, and I don't know what started the Spanish flu. It was really a big deal, though. The, um, my sister knows all about it. It's, it's like one of the record-setting epidemics in the world. It was like killed an enormous number of people. I guess it started in Spain. I don't know. By the way, they say don't name them after locations anymore because it just makes people bigoted and everything. Uh, but they're, trying, they're still trying to come up with an official name for the coronavirus. Like th tomorrow, they're supposed to announce the official name. And there's a bunch of rules, like don't name it after a region or anything. But when they're this slow to name it, I think another name is going to take over. Like I think the people that make Corona beer are not very happy with this yeah. name. So anyway, um, all right. So I'm going to stop the share, and I'll see you folks next week. I'll hang around here for a while to see if anybody wants help on projects. Uh, I'll just stop this share in the recording. Thank you, sir. Sure. Have a good night. Question number one.